about peer evaluation. Most of you got the, have started and submitted your peer evaluations. Uh, if you have not you received an email about it. Everyone who got the email at least, right? Okay, check your McMaster email that uh, the first batch of peer evaluations are due tomorrow evening. But, uh, tomorrow afternoon evening, I'll send out the next two PDFs to you, so your second and third evaluation. And then for those of you that have requested to get a fourth and a fifth evaluation, I'll also send those out. So this first one is just to kind of get you warmed up and used to it. And then I'll send out two, three, and for those of you the option. Okay, so it's clear that uh, I understand this, it's not acceptable to submit no, no feedback. Um, we do want to see some feedback, constructive feedback. And by and large, everything I've seen so far has been very good and positive in terms of the content being written. Uh, I just, I don't want, like, there's no sense repeating back to me what the person did. It's like, uh, I noticed this, well, okay, the student knows that. That's not constructive feedback. Constructive feedback is um, suggestions on improvements. But not to say, I saw that you used blocking. That's, that's not a helpful comment. So like how the uh how the text or how the part you put out like what you should like point one and how we should be the other like one mark saying like one mark saying this one could that. So you don't want to feel like data that's the point rather say like you can yeah, you can it's a trade-off, right? I, I understand that you want to show that you've used the rubric, yeah. but I also I, you don't need to rewrite the whole line back to me. Okay. Right? So you can say walking covered. Yeah. Okay. But if you feel that walking wasn't described properly, Say it's rather state that than state that talking was covered. Okay. So the idea is that I will compile the four or five, because notice that there's 50, 50 group reports in the class, there's 90 people. So even if everyone does their three peer evaluations, you'll have five different people looking at your reports. I'll compile all those com comments back and email you um, mid April. Okay. So the idea is sort of just before the final exam, I, I will receive all the feedback back from everyone. That back to you as some feedback to hold the study for the moment. Everyone clear on that? Okay. Great. Um, I must say, I'm really, really impressed with what I've seen so far and the, the high level of feedback that you've been given. So that's, that's great to see. Um, also, parenthetically, uh, you may be wondering why I'm trying this out. I'm trying this out because I'll be teaching designing experiments online as a MOOC on Coursera over the summer, and the peer evaluation is. Is the only way that grading is done on those three platforms. And also, you guys may not be aware, during the last class that's taking four C3 face to face, next year is moving to an entirely online format, and then peer evaluation will become the normal in that sort of online environment. So, um, well, it won't be entirely online. All the lectures will be delivered online, but they will be still interactive class exercises. So, all of these are just ways that the university is moving towards online systems, and so we're trying out different. Okay, so let's take a look back at where we left off yesterday. Um, oh, one other thing. I thought maybe just to introduce this topic, uh, I received this email a few days ago. This is from a former student from two years ago. He says, I'm with company XYZ at the moment, will be in Styrene Monument Production. This is in Sarnia, Ontario. As you can imagine, we use Aspen Technology. Um, he's referring there to IP21. IP21 is a database from Aspen to store and stream millions of data every second. Uh, data analysis is key to understanding and troubleshooting in this position. So that's, uh, that's a, a normal statement for every one of you in the class. A lot of you will find yourself in the troubleshooting. Then the third paragraph for the most awesome task of Facebook is the mass balance correlations and process monitoring dashboards. Okay, so what he's referring to there is the generation of these process monitoring charts, but the upper control limits, the lower control limits, how do the operators do that? That's uh, what the monitoring dashboard is. Um, he suggested maybe the course was in class, and so his, his email was to request more efforts into the process okay, So this just kind of gives you a bit of context of where you can apply the skills from this course. You can make good strides in your career by creating some of these monitoring systems in your company. So my suggestion in yesterday's class is that, that you try the monitoring system on your, at your own desk for a while to test out what is your type 1 error and what is your type 2 error. 
So that's my suggestion is that these monitoring charts are only successful <coughs> if you have a good balance between type 1 error and type 2 error. So alpha then is your measure of type 1 error, beta is your measure of type 2 error. And ideally you would like both of those errors to have almost zero probability. And what I said last class, you can never achieve both. You can never have both low alpha and low beta. In fact, what happens is, if you look um, at this alpha, you can make arbitrarily low by moving those limits wider and wider. So move up control limit higher and move the lower control limit lower, and you'll get a very low alpha. You'll get no false alarms. But the moment you do that, your beta also your beta goes up. So alpha will go down and beta will go up. And if you shrink the limits in, beta will go down and alpha will go up. So you can never achieve both goals simultaneously. Let's talk about another issue that comes up. People often don't appreciate this in our monitoring charts. But many times the data that we monitor are correlated. Take a look at these two variables. Do you notice any particular trends? Anything you notice in those data? So beware of that as a trap when you're going in the 
is looking at univariate monetary chart. A univariate monetary chart is not a perfect chart when you've got correlated data. Let's take a look at another issue I pointed out yesterday. We said that when you look at the Schwab chart, a very small shift in the data is in fact not detected. Let's take a look at that as an example. Here's a sequence of 200 points, and everything's okay. So notice there's a, there's a regular amount of scatter in there. Everything looks okay. Now what if I told you at time 150, a very small shift occurred? A very small shift of about 0.4 sigma occurred at time 100. Can you pick it up visually? You kind of can if, if I told you where it is. Right? It's a, but if I hadn't told you, you may not have seen it. Okay? And in fact, the Schwab chart will probably not even align. It will shift a little bit above the target, but it won't alarm right away. So what we want is we want a monitoring chart that's very sensitive to picking up deviations from target. The reason for that is there's many applications where this works well. One I mentioned yesterday was if you're feeding raw material to a tank at a certain flow, say 100 liters per minute, you want it to stay at 100 liters per minute. If you start deviating above that, you start overfilling the tank and you don't get the conversions that you need. Um, how many of you are familiar with flotation? Okay, so air flotation where you're bubbling air into a froth, and I showed you what those bubbles look like uh, two classes ago. So you're bubbling air into one of those vessels, and those air bubbles are keeping the material suspended and bringing the valuable mineral to the top. Often the valuable mineral rises and the mineral that you're not interested in sinks. Sometimes it's the other way around. But the key is that the, the air flow rate is a critical variable. Too much air and you're going to float up all the stuff from the bottom that you don't want. Too little air and this valuable material is going to sink. So you don't get the good separation you need. There's a very fine balance there on the variable. There's many chemical processes that, and, and other uh, processes that you can think of where keeping something just at target is an important criteria. So here's a chart that will do the work for us. It's called the cumulative sum chart. And what it does is it gets the sensitivity because it's going to keep a cumulative track of the deviations from target. So here's your data point, subtract it from the target so you get this delta, this deviation from the target. That's what you monitor. Don't monitor the data point, you monitor the deviation from the target. At the next time step, you take the previous deviation, but you add to it the new deviation that's just come. So the next time point, you get your raw data point, the next one, subtract it from the target as well, and you spot those two deviations summed up. The third time point, you acquire x2. Now that's your new data point. Plug in the deviation, add up that deviation to the prior two deviations. Now, the process that's operating at target will have points distributed above and below this line on a roughly even basis. So these deviations above and deviations below will continually cancel each other out. And so when you calculate that cumulative sum of deviations, you get a number that's just gently drifting up and down, but isn't deviating significantly away from zero. The moment a change occurs, let's say that change is capital delta, so your new x value you're requiring is the raw data point plus this delta deviation, you're going to keep summing this delta in every turn. And very quickly, the line is going to take off. Delta is a positive, or it's very quickly going to drop down negative if the deviation is a negative delta. Okay. So a cumulative sum is a great way and very sensitive monitoring chart to picking up these deviations. So here's, here you can see the cumulative sum. Here's your raw data. We don't plot that. We in fact just plot the cumulative sum. As I mentioned, this is a line that sort of drift, drifts up and down, up and down, and there's no control limits on this. Well, obviously, if it's going to stay around zero. The way we monitor this chart for a significant deviation is by putting what's called a V mask. So a V mask is exactly shown there, 
and the monitoring limits are calculated by the angle of the mask. So the wider the mask, the more tolerance you have, the narrower the mask, the less tolerance. And the way we pick up when a, a problem has occurred is when that mask's arms, upwards and downwards, V arms, when the line crosses, so right now you see this black curve stays within the red limits, it's within the V. That's a normal, normal process, nothing has gone wrong. Now let's take a look here. Here the problem occurs around 150. You see a small shift upwards, and you can see this cumulative sun chart starts to rise. And that black line tracks across the arms of the mask. So then we know the problem has occurred. So the monitoring limits, there are monitoring limits for the cumulative sun chart. The monitoring limits are essentially the angle of the arms. If you put a wider angle over there, you're going to tolerate greater shift. But a very narrow angle, you're going to tolerate and go along much faster. Yeah, it's, it's also where you set yourself back from. The vertical line is where you currently are at at this moment in time. Okay. So it's, it's another parameter that you can set. So we won't we, like the previous courses on this. We spend a lot of time calculating the angle theta, and then you use this uh, very complex <coughs> equation with the tangent of theta to figure out what your alpha one, your alpha and beta are. You don't need to do that. The computers take care of all that uh, messy um, calculations for us. The same, I just want you to get the principle of cumulative sum chart. So let's maybe uh, track this in, in the following way. We can. Note here that my Schuart chart, my Schuart chart uses the concept that every point, every point is independent. Okay. So every single plot, every single dot that's shown on the Schuart chart in time, every one of those is independent of the other. Why go right back up here earlier to the Schumann chart's derivation? Every single point, x bar 1, is totally independent of x bar 2, independent of x bar 3, x bar 4. There's no overlap between the individual points. Go back forward where we were to the, to the cumulative sum chart, take a look at that formula. This formula is taking s2 as an example, is an infinite sum all the data going backwards in time. In fact, we can write it in this recursive way that the current S is equal to the previous S plus the new delta. Well, the previous S is a function of the previous X. And the one before that is a function of the X before that still. So, in fact, the cumulative sum chart is totally the opposite of a sure chart. It has what we say infinite memory. So every data point is dependent on all the data that comes prior to it. Its memory extends right back to the very beginning, S0. Now, one way we use the Cusin chart is that, let's say a problem is detected, figure out that this line crosses the, the arms of the V mask. What we do is at that moment when we once we fix up the problem, we reset the Q's chart back to zero. And we start over again. So that infinite memory is used loosely. It's infinite up to the last time you reset the chart. So now let's look at a trade-off perhaps. The trade-off is what's called the moving average chart. The moving average chart has a window of memory. So if we, rather, we take the Schuart chart idea, but we modify it a little bit. So the Schuart chart says take x1 to x5, the next data point gives x6 to x10. What the moving average chart does is it does a little bit of a smearing of the data. It says take x1 to x5, and then take x2 to x6, x3 to x7, and it calculates the moving average all the time. If I add Four data points. Let me 
because what you notice is that these weights never get exactly to zero. You can take lambda times 1 minus lambda to the power n. It just becomes a number that tends towards zero. So it has infinite memory, but it has declining weights to all, all data. This makes sense, right? We have an intuitive expectation that if I want to predict the temperature one hour from now, the current temperature is more valuable than the temperature five hours ago. Okay. So if I put more weight on my current data that I've just acquired, xt, and I put less weight on data that I've acquired prior to that. So this, we have an intuitive expectation that this sort of setup will work well for us. Okay. The only thing we have to pick now is lambda. Right? That's our only, our only free variable. And what I've shown you here is what different values of lambda do. So the lambda of 0.8 gives you rate of 8 cents, 16 percent, 3.2 percent, and then 0 0.6 percent. If you add up all those weights there, you see they pretty much add up to 1. If we chose lambda 0.6, we're giving 60% weight to the most recent point, 24, then uh, 9.6, then 3.8, and declining in that way. A lambda of 0.2 gives very small weights to each one, 20%, 16%, 12 and a half, 10, and I, you go further and further back, and if you go farther and farther back, then those weights will add up to approximately. What's interesting is the comparison to a moving average chart. The moving average chart gives equal weight to every point in time and then stops. There's nothing after that. If I add m, uh, so m equals 4, the number of samples is 25, 25, 25, 25 percent weight to the most recent moving points. And then I ignore everything prior to that. So one way we can visualize the weighting process is by showing it as follows. Here's a great way to compare these four monitoring charts. The Shulop chart gives a weight of 100% to the most recent data. A cumulative sum chart, which has infinite memory, gives a very, very small weight to every data point right back to time zero. A moving average chart gives equal weighting to your most recent n point, so if n was 5, so 5 weights of 20 and an EWMA chart, here I've shown with lambda point 3, gives the sort of declining weights. So it still has some sort of window on the data, but it gives more weight to the most recent data. Now, what do we monitor on an EWMA chart? If you are implementing an EWMA chart in your company, that's what you plot on your plot. Plot xt has t plus 1. This is a one step ahead prediction. Okay. You're predicting the future one step ahead based on your current data with declining weights back into the past. And in fact, for any of you that have gone through business school, you've probably seen or heard of EWMA, you might have called it something different. Um, this is a very efficient one step ahead predictor. You can, you can get really good predictions with this model, and the only thing that you have to select is lambda. A good rule of thumb, if you've got no, no better knowledge, is pick a lambda of about 0 0.4. 0 0.4 seems to be a good value for many data sets, as a good initial guess. But it's very easy to find what your lambda is. You simply move it up and down and you calculate the sum of squares of prediction errors and until you find pick a lambda that gives you the least prediction error. But a good starting value is about one. Okay, so what does it look like? Well, here's, here's an example given in the notes. We're going to go backwards here in the slides. The orange points are your raw data, the blue points are your EW predictions. Is that trend being predicted out into the future? So you see, it, there's a little bit of a, it takes a little while for the EWA to warm up. Its predictions at the beginning aren't so good, but after it warms up, you get pretty efficient predictions once they're about to get into the future. Really, really good predictor, in this case, uh, for things like on processes that move very slowly. Uh, 
Um, you can actually do quite well on this. Like, let's say you're running a batch process, and each batch is six hours. And you, make, you send off that batch to the lab to the um, uh, check for quality control. You can often make a prediction of what the next batch's purity is based on previous batches. So if, you, if this is the purity of each batch, you can make predictions of the future batches quite, quite nicely. The reason is because typically you're using the same raw materials and the same equipment and the same environment to make the next batch. So there's a there's a batch-to-batch -batch tracking that's possible. Another example of this is um, being able to predict things on distillation columns, purities, and otherwise other properties from the distillation column. Any process that moves fairly slowly, um, you can make very efficient one step. The other nice um, result we get from this is we can actually rewrite the EWA. So I'm going back to another slide again. We can write the EWA in recursive form. This format that I show up here on the board, this is not very useful for implementation because to implement it, you need to keep in the memory of your computer somewhere all your x values back in time. So no one likes to keep large vectors or values in their computer systems. But what we can do is we can write it in a recursive format that says my prediction one step in into the future is lambda times my current raw value plus one minus lambda times my previous prediction. So all that you have to keep in your computer's memory is the previous prediction and the current value of x. So you step, predict one step into the future, now that x hat t plus one becomes your previous x hat of t. And you recursively apply this formula over time. That recursive formula as written there has a really good interpretation as well that shows exactly what the EWA chart is doing. Let's just write it out here. Lambda gets closer and closer to zero, you're giving more weight to a 
historical data. So which type of chart does that approach? Lambda gets close to zero. There's only one other chart we've covered. <laughs> so it's the Kiesel chart, right? So as lambda gets closer to zero, it says you're giving all your importance to your history. That is, let's try out different parameters. So here's, here's the raw data we saw earlier. We saw my data moving around, and then at time 150, there was that slight shift upwards in the raw values. Let's take a look at what an EWMA chart does. An EWMA chart has upper and lower control limits. I'll show you the formula for that in a minute. But with 0.8, so lambda here is closer and closer to 1, it behaves very much like a shoe chart. Lambda tends to one. We, pick, we almost barely pick up that ball. This, this is essentially a Schumann chart. As lambda gets closer and closer to zero, we start to approximate the behavior more of a Q-sub chart. And remember, a Q-sub chart is very sensitive to small shifts in the data. So at about 150, it takes a while. After a while, we actually do pick up the ball. We can go to smaller and smaller lambdas. So here, a lambda. One, we pick up that shift pretty quickly. And here I've just shown a comparison with the Houston chart. So notice the Houston chart, how similar it looks in terms of its time series shape to the EWMA chart. And obviously, if I take that and even smaller still, this starts to look very much like. There's an 
PW and V charts as well if you're interested in tracking the variability of the process. Okay, and then the last uh, key portion that I want to emphasize here is you've got to monitor your process, but you also need to fix it up. Uh, I mentioned this back in Monday's class. A key shortcoming of process monitoring systems is that people will monitor, they pick up the problem, they go fix it temporarily. All that's doing is it's just going to leave you waiting until the next problem. So making a permanent fix to the process is going to get you to the advantage, not better handling. Okay, so what I just want to talk about next here is kind of get you thinking about monitoring systems on modern processes in the way that you will certainly experience them in your career. The first one here is uh, from a tablet manufacturing processing a pharmaceutical company, but you will also see this in petroleum manufacturing for sure. What companies now do is that they'll take a laser, much like this laser pointer, and they put it on a pipe in their process. So for the fluid flowing, you have this laser embedded in the pipe, and there's a light beam being crossed in the pipe that will track any of the fluid or the gas flowing along that pipeline. That laser will then have a variety of wavelengths in it. It's not a single wavelength laser, it will have multiple wavelengths. And you have inside the laser, you have another sensor, so the light bouncing back into the sensor will record the transmission or the reflectance through the pipe. So you can either put it as transmission or reflectance of the fluids. Um, either way, it can be instrumented. And what you'll then acquire from that instrument, which is fairly expensive but not that outrageous in price, but still very affordable for most companies, is you will acquire not one number, but multiple numbers. Okay. So one of these curves is acquired at one particular point in time. We've been looking at monitoring up to now as a single number that you track. So a single expert <coughs> that temperature, pH. But in your career, you're going to encounter situations where the data you acquire is not a scalar, but is a vector. How do you deal with this problem is many particular approaches are possible and work well. But one approach that companies use and is extremely wasteful is they pick a particular wavelength, let's say 1,200, because that's maybe where an interesting characteristic of the peak appears, and they simply monitor that value over there. So they back down to monitoring the scale. There's 460, <coughs> sorry, not 460, there's 460 horizontal lines here. I meant to say 650. So you've got a vector of 650 data points from left to right. And they pick one of those and they throw the others away. So they ignore the other 649 data points and they simply use one of the 650. Now they're back to something that they're happy with and easy to use. <clears throat> but what if there is something interesting in those other 649 data points? What might be a way that you can think of Use those other data effectively. Take a minute, maybe talk with the person around you. How could you effectively use all 650 data points from one of those spectra to monitor the process? Think of at least two ways that you could do this. <coughs>
some suggestions. Any ways that you might use the full 650 elements of that vector? What's the crudest approach to this? 650 monitoring charts. Absolutely. Maybe 5 or 10 even, right? if you're thinking of this from a practical point of view, you could pick 5 or 6, 7 locations and put the monitoring chart for each location in there. It's on up for a low control rates. Any other suggestions?